Please, but yet they're still holding out for the lowest price possible. Um, you know, have you know? Are these investors really looking just f simply for value, or I mean, we heard this morning that you know quality is also a, a top issue. I mean, what what is really the driving force behind investors today? So that's a place to park your money. We were seeing a lot of uh, we call them zeros, where you had exchanges that were looking to park money to defer tax, and that's what you're seeing a lot today. I think you're also getting, and it gets again back to the 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 core is where we're starting to see a lot of investments where your lenders will look at that, and your buyers are 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 are, are looking at that. I think again in that B and C, you know, huge value add market. It's just not. It's not happening. You know, I mean, lenders aren't aren't buying into it. I mean, if you're buying something, it's got to be straight down the middle of the fairway, for it to even make sense in pencil. So that's where we're really seeing most of our activity today. Paul, any thoughts on that? No, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think um, when prospective buyers are looking at doing deals nowadays, uh, it's increasingly easier to find positive leverage, which is when your cap rate is higher than your mortgage rate basically um, and so with cheap money out there um, you know a lot of investors are trying to sink their teeth into these deals where they can lock into low mortgage rates and capitalize on that strong cash flow uh, the one word of caution that I would you know really try to echo is that you have to be very cognizant of where your NOI growth expectations are going forward uh, in real terms and so what do I mean by that for example um, you know right now cap rates are very low and one of the reasons they're very low is because interest rates are very low. Uh, the thing is though that usually when the interest rate rises the cap rate tends to move along with it. Now that's not entirely true in a situation like we have now. So if you look uh, at the apartment market for example, the you know median long range spread between the cap rate and the treasury is about 280 basis points. Right now we're somewhere between 80 and 100 basis points uh, north of that which basically means we have a little bit of slack. So if interest rates go up, cap rates do not necessarily have to follow suit um, in a lockstep fashion. So I'd say if you have about 100 basis points of slack and the treasury does go up, investors are probably fairly safe. The one word of caution though is if cap rates do move up, then all of a sudden, like I said, the NOI becomes the primary issue. In a situation, for example, that your cap rate goes up, your NOI, if it doesn't follow suit, the property will deteriorate in value. So if you just look at it uh, mathematically, let's say your cap rate is 5%. If your cap rate goes up from 5% to 5.5%, that's a half, a half a point rise, which equates to 10% on the cap rate, which means your NOI has to follow by 10%. NOI increasing by 10% in, in an environment where today we're looking at rent growth of 2 to 3% is not very likely. But if you're focusing on a market where you have high barriers to entry, uh, constrained supply like Kurt had, Kirk had mentioned, strong uh, industry growth, then potentially you can achieve that. Um, so if you look at that trajectory, you have to have the expectation that you're going to be able to follow suit. Otherwise, you don't make the decision to purchase because you're only going to lose out on that value proposition. Um, well, my my secret life is that of a multifamily investor, so I can I can I can happily answer that. Um, in fact, I've uh, I've been a strong proponent against rent control. I don't know if any of you have uh, read my work on it, but um, I'm I'm not a fan. But uh, putting that aside, uh, I think it's increasingly important if you're looking at um, at multifamily rental rates, and if you look at growth, and you say to yourself that the interest rate could potentially cripple values, um, the silver lining to that cloud 
is usually when we have higher interest rates, it comes uh, in tandem with an, an inflationary environment. And so as we saw during the Carter administration, you know, between 1975 or 19, uh, about 76 and 79, in Los Angeles, many places experienced a doubling or a tripling of real estate values. Uh, and that was in tandem with high cap rates and very, very high interest rate. So potentially what we could see, you know, not necessarily that we'll see runaway inflation. I don't believe that to be on the horizon because of where employment and capacity utilization are right now. But uh, if you look at a situation where cap rates do go up because of interest rate increases, we're potentially going to come on the heels of strong rent growth, which would increase the equity of owners of real estate. Uh, in doing so, it would be increasing asset values, but your debt, of, of course, is devaluing in a cycle like that, um, which kind of brings you back to Richard's original point, and that is that you know if you do buy real estate and you hold it for the long term and you are in, in an inflationary environment, you're obviously better off than those who don't own the real estate because they're being priced out of the market while you're actually growing your equity base and able to then uh, experience and enjoy the benefits of, you know, um, refinancing, taking out equity, uh, purchasing more property, and so on and so forth. So that, you know, that game does become uh, self-fulfilling in many ways. Do you have anything to add to that? Mm -hmm. Okay. No, very good. I actually have a question. I'm trying, to, I'm trying, to, get some, uh, trying to get down to our panelists on the other end of the table here. I actually do have a question for you, Kirk. Um, declining sales, decreasing uh, property values, depleted <laughs> bank resources, they're all part of this overwhelming evidence that um, that this, to support the likelihood that uh, commercial real estate loans will become an even more serious problem. Um, are further bank uh, bailouts related to commercial property loans likely? Um, I don't think so. I, I think, um, to be honest with you, with the American banking sector, I think the Fed's got it fairly well cleaned up. I'm not saying that there aren't problems. Um, Bank of America still has some issues. Citibank can't seem to do anything right. Um, you know, well, they uh, split their stock. It went up to 40, and now it's fallen down in half again. So um, Wells Fargo seems to be fairly, uh, fairly strong. The point is, I really don't think the... Um, I, I think the banking sector in the United States is just going to trudge along. Uh, I don't think we're that, and you know, Paul, if you know differently, let me know. But I don't think we're overly exposed to some of the sovereign debt in Europe. We do have some exposure in the United banking sector, but it's not a big exposure. The point being is I don't think, uh, I'm not too worried about the health and welfare of the banking sector in terms of uh, anyone failing. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that banks are loaning money. Uh, they say they've got money. They say that they're lending money. But the majority of the people that I talk to still can't get uh, a home loan, for example. Or the restrictions that are placed on them to get the loan are quite onerous. So, um, you know, I don't think banks are in trouble. Uh, I don't think they're at risk of default but I don't think they're uh, willing to lend. And part of that is just because the banks are just as scared as the consumers. I mean, they really got slapped around, um, uh, both privately uh, by the Federal Reserve, FDIC, but also publicly. Um, you know, now there are people occupying Wall Street slapping the banks around a little bit more. Um, so they've, they're a little gun shy. Um, one of the things that we heard this morning was about um, the, you know, the fact that um, our supply, that we have, uh, you know, an oversupply and that part of what's dragging us down is the fact that we have so many foreclosure properties and we have short sales going on. Um, you know, why is it still taking so long to process these properties um, for, for those in the, in the residential uh, market for realtors to, to get this done? Um, are the banks to blame for that? I just answered one. I, in a way, yes, the banks are to blame for it. Uh, in other words, if they write those loans down, if they don't do the short sale s syndrome there, if, if it is, moves into foreclosure, then they've just, they're going to have to set aside more reserves. And so as they destroy their portfolio by quickly reacting to what's called the shadow inventory out there, their reserve requirements will increase dramatically and the bank could be out of business depending on the size of the bank. So uh, it's a, a, very, uh, a very slow dance uh, with these assets as we move them back. Uh, if you remember in the last downturn in the 90s, we 
developed a, a feature called the R RTC. Uh, it was a separate entity, and we dumped all those assets from the SNLs into the RTC. And you know, I'm not saying it was a good process. Uh, a lot of people got very wealthy as that happened, as they also got wealthy as the SNLs grew. But those assets, it was a process that did work, and they were moved into the market relatively quick. What we've caused here presently is a mad scramble uh, by investors. Uh, we were talking about the investors earlier uh, from all over the world, uh, China, Canada, uh, you know, Wall Street, uh, some European money, uh, chasing the assets that are still held by some of these banks. And we were talking about single family, but remember we were also in the middle of one of the largest cycles ever to occur in real estate, and so we have projects that maybe 2,000, 3,000 homes with infrastructure in ready to go, uh, but nobody's paying on the loan. And so those assets are what the mad scramble uh, is that's going on today, and they know California will be back, we know California will be back, and these assets will be very valuable at some point in time. Originally, as the downturn started, we were looking at most of these investors were considering a, maybe a three to five year hold before they could reinstitute selling those lots to public builders and we could start going vertical and creating homes no matter where they were located throughout the cal whole California region. And presently, uh, only those with the wherewithal uh, to consider a five to seven year hold, maybe longer, are looking at these assets uh, presently. And so they're not moving quickly enough into the market. It's causing some appreciation in price. Uh, they still are massively discounted below what we call the manufacturing cost, the cost to buy the dirt, put the pipes in, get the approvals, just the raw manufacturing of the commodity, which is the finished lot to go vertical with a, with a housing structure on. So there's a lot of discount there. There's still a lot of room for profit. but. This is not the 90s. They're not moving quickly enough that we can correct. And what it's going to cause is disproportionate appreciation as we take the slack out of the rope. And what that means in some areas in Southern California, you're going to have corrections in your local housing market because it was undersupplied even in the boom. Because as was pointed out earlier, we have such a slow processing in many markets in California. It's very difficult to get approvals, uh, right or wrong. So some areas are going to improve better. Uh, we have seen successes where Standard Pacific opened a project in Brea in March with 48 homes priced 800000 up uh, with premiums about a million two, and by July of this year, all 48 of them were sold. Now, and you drove through an old neighborhood to get to those 48 homes. We've seen successes on the coast with the Irvine Company, so we are seeing successes happen in Playa Vista, uh, you know, everywhere. Santa Clarita now has some new product coming online, but the problem's going to be in continually supplying that with the base fodder of the industry, these finished lots. They're going to be held by these large uh, entities, these financial groups that are buying them up, uh, and they're going to slowly bring them back into the market. So the appreciation in the new home will probably be far ahead of what we see happen in the resale market. So it's going to be very expensive uh, as we move forward to purchase a new home in Southern California eventually here. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, I think on the commercial side, we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of workouts. Again, it's very few distress that have really been and come to market. I mean, if you today, what's driving commercial to the market are really the three Ds with divorce, death, and dissolution of a partnership, and then loan maturities are the other things that are bringing product to market. But other than that, um, we, we're just we're seeing a lot of loans getting worked out. I think a lot of these lenders would would prefer to stay with somebody who's committed, somebody who had equity, even though the equity is gone, but would like to see them stay with with uh, with those type of of, uh, of arrangements. So that's what we're seeing. Great, thank you. I saw a question in the back. You want to stand up and.
great question. My favorite question. You stepped right in my trap. Uh, so real, as far as real estate development is concerned, uh, inland, coastal, the standards are – they don't change that much. In California, we have CEQA, right, California Environmental Quality Act. It's basically a tax on developers uh, putting up new product. I mean, that's the simple version of it. Um, it requires – uh, an act of God to get anything built in the state of California. What, what is actually the, the primary difference between the two regions? One is the availability of, of raw land, okay? And the second thing is the, the neighborhood opposition. And the neighborhood opposition in coastal communities tends to be a lot more stringent uh, uh, and a lot more uh, onerous than it does in, in, state, in, in parts of the country where you can just you know, put up another row of houses, a couple of palm trees, and a golf course. Uh, very different environments. So I'd, looking from that perspective, I don't think you want to over-regulate development anywhere. I don't necessarily think that's the solution. I think it's the natural economic landscape that lends itself to that. Uh, but in terms of whether you should force the banks to work out more mortgages, um, so two quick things. Uh, stepping off of uh, Steve's point, the RTC, there's a proposal that was at least announced. It's still you know, not official, I don't think, yet, uh, to create an RTC-type structure for single-family residences. That's being proposed. Uh, the second is we just had uh, the, the HARP, the Home Affordable Refinance Program, which was kind of reiterated as, as being the next potential solution for the housing, um, the housing crisis. Uh, that coming off the heels of the Home Affordable Modification Program, which was only about 30% successful on taking a, a mortgage modification, making it permanent. The real issue we have is that 55% of all the modifications that are made are due to a loss of borrower income. So if the, the person can't make the underlying mortgage payment, it really doesn't matter what you do with that, that principal balance. You can make the interest rate zero and give them a 50-year uh, amortization period, and they're still gonna, not going to be able to make the payment. So we have a fundamental disconnect in policy and reality. And I think you know, one of the reasons we've had such an issue in getting to the bottom of this housing market is because the government keeps meddling in, in, in ways that are ineffective. Okay, the reality is the only thing that's going to solve the housing crisis is time. And once our society realizes that leverage is not an answer to anything, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a magnifying glass. It's not a steroid. And the, the faster that our consumer uh, realizes that, the faster we can, you know, kind of heal uh, the, the issue in housing and, and create a recovery which is based on fundamentals. Do I have any other questions out there? In the back. There, there's really two points to the shadow inventory. Uh, yes, the banks weren't staffed up originally. Uh, they could not handle the amount of foreclosure activity. And I, you don't know the number of stories that are told to me about the guy who lives down the street from someone who they know stopped mowing his lawn. His lawn died, and so they know he stopped making his payment because he's home every day all day, and he's been there for two and a half years. And finally, it does resolve itself. And there's stories like that rampant throughout California. There is this shadow inventory that they couldn't deal with. They couldn't get to quick enough. And the other side of the story is why would they want to? Because their reserve requirements would be, would be hit pretty hard. Um, they found a way around that. Uh, it's called not fi filing the notice of default. Uh, the homeowner calls them up and says, I'm upside down. I want out. We just can't deal with this. And oftentimes what we see happening is prior to the NOD, that house is listed with their preferred uh, real estate company, and it is sold before you even see an NOD action on the house at a short sale. 
so they've inter interjected that, that they've intercepted the, uh, the whole process. So that is going on. There is an enormous shadow inventory throughout the country. Uh, unfortunately, when you have a bubble like this, you build a lot of the wrong product in the wrong place. Uh, you know, so whether it's Mesquite, Nevada, uh, you know, whether it's northern Arizona, or whether it's downtown LA, uh, we are working our way through it. And one thing I will say about the California markets, we've done an incredible job cleaning up a lot of product that was built in the wrong places. Uh, we built far too many attached product downtown LA with no parking. That was just brilliant. Uh, <laughs> If you go to San Diego and you look at the skyline, if you haven't been there in a few years, it's incredible. You almost think you're in Miami. And we've taken 7,000 attached units and moved that inventory down to just 2,000. Uh, so we are cleaning up a lot of that inventory that's out there, the single family as well that litters, littered throughout our land. One of the things we've seen here in the basin that's been incredible um, are people abandoning their house in the Inland Empire, uh, moving back to be near mom and dad and buying homes back in the valley. We saw Koreatown go on fire with its attached product out there uh, because you know all the small four unit, eight unit buildings, just people were, were saying these values are great. And their parents, their grandparents would step up, loan them the money for the down payment. Well, now that inventory is gone. Uh, but we've seen a, a flight back to the basin with $4 gasoline, that's what's gonna happen. We talk about the inland markets and, and whether they should have onerous development uh, uh, laws or rulings to slow their development like the coastal communities, there's no problem there. Because what we really did as an industry is we p fooled them into thinking that fees were the way to structure their environment. So they believe this, they have a $10,000 fee per house for their freeways that don't exist yet, their transportation, their bridges. And the fees stack up to almost $90,000 a house and you haven't bought a stick, you haven't bought a piece of concrete, and that's what the fees are out there. Now, right now, they've been able to negotiate with jurisdictions and reduce those fees to about half, okay, to, so they can hopefully get some housing moving. But all of those negotiations are annual, and they have to be renewed. A couple of them are biannual. And so those fees are gonna jump up, and the self-taxing that's occurring in the Inland Empire, combined with the $4 gas, is gonna to continue to make the coastal communities more important. People were really moving to the inland communities because of that equity. It was better than their 401k. So the inland communities aren't gonna recover. We talk about that shadow inventory and a lot of it is in the inland communities. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, that's gonna be a longer term investment. If you pick up shadow inventory, uh, I wouldn't be as concerned in the basin uh, we've got some great, you know, drivers to this economy here, and obviously we all know it's going to come back. So, uh, but in those inland areas, that those taxations, those fees, the existing inventory that's been built is going to slow that recovery for some time. Thank you, Steve. Um, I want to broaden out the conversation a little bit. In the minds of all, you know, in all of our minds, um, in, when we talk about the economy, obviously the job growth, the lack of job growth, um, and that has obviously an impact um, not just on the jobs front in America, but also it hurts the real estate market too. So um, I'm just curious to the panel, um, what are some of the job sectors um, where you see the most activity in terms of, you know, that? playing out in the real estate market, and um, what are the sectors that continue to struggle? Well, Steve, first I want to know what's wrong with Mesquite, Nevada. <laughs> I mean, I went running to the bulls there one time, so. Um, 